Welcome to Exploring a Course in Miracles. I am here with my wife, Emily. I am Robert Perry, and we are here with Joe Marino, talking today about the Shroud of Turin. As most of you know, the Shroud has been venerated for centuries as the burial cloth of Jesus. It's a linen cloth that's 14 and a half feet long, three and a half feet wide. It's fully documented history, goes back to the 14th century, though there are many intriguing theories of the names it may have gone by in centuries before that. The Shroud is arguably the, the most intensely studied artifact in history. And what launched the scientific study of the Shroud was the very first photograph taken of it in 1898 by an Italian photographer. When he held up the negative plate, suddenly on the negative plate, it looked like a real face. And he said he almost dropped the plate. Since then, the shroud has been studied by many scientific disciplines. In fact, our guest, Joe Marino, has put together a list of 102 disciplines that have studied the shroud. For instance, atomic resolution studies, bacteriology, biochemistry. This is a real science. This, this is real science. So why do we care? I'll, I'll give my thoughts on this before we dive into the interview. If the shroud is genuine, it means that Jesus was tortured, crucified, and buried in the exact manner indicated in the Gospels. Further, the shroud itself may also be a kind of photograph of the resurrection. For students of A Course in Miracles, and our podcast is Exploring A Course in Miracles, it has additional significance. The Course says the crucifixion was a teaching demonstration and that the resurrection was, quote, the final demonstration that all of the other lessons Jesus taught are true. And with the Shroud, we may have a vivid record of both demonstrations made with the blood of the crucifixion and the light of the resurrection. The Shroud's been an important part of my own spiritual journey. Going back to 1978, I read an an article in Omni Magazine. Um, I've done a little bit of speaking and writing on the topic, uh, but I always get drawn back to the topic because with the shroud, you feel like you're touching that original figure in a way that nothing else does. That being said, I'm very far from being an expert, and that's why we are honored to have with us with us today, one of the leading experts on the Shroud. Joe Marino first encountered a book on the Shroud in 1977. It, as I've heard him tell the story, rekindled his Christian faith, and that led to him becoming a Benedictine monk in 1980. He left the monastery eventually to join forces with his late wife, Sue Benford, together in the year 2000. They brought forward the invisible reweave hypothesis, which has been a major contribution to shroud studies, and which we'll talk about. He's authored two books, the latest one on the carbon dating, gigantic book, and over 70 articles. The articles are, avail are available at academia.edu. Joe has recently retired for, <clears throat> from Ohio State University, but remains extremely active with the course, sorry, with the shroud. He has said that ever since he first encountered the shroud, he's felt a calling in relation to it. And that calling has clearly borne fruit and still drives him. So welcome, Joe. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for having me. And it's nice to be here with you. All right. So Joe, I, I just echo Robert's uh, introduction and and welcome to you on on the show. You ha have obviously devoted your life to the study of the shroud. So mm -hmm. let's just start with the big question because I'm assuming that there's some baseline familiarity in our listeners with the shroud, but not a, a lot of in-depth knowledge. So starting with just the very basic general question, if the shroud is authentic, 
what significance does this have to our world? Well, I think it adds uh, some empiricism to the claims of Christianity. Um, you know, Christianity is an historical religion. Um, Jesus lived in a specific place and time uh, that we can study historically. And now we, it looks like we have an object that uh, we can, we have studied scientifically. Um, and it, it has enlightened the scriptures in terms of the four gospels. Um, it kind of caters to our need to, you know, we're a very image oriented society right now. And um, we have that marvelous image, the front and back image of the shroud. When you, when you see it with the naked eye, it's not, as clear as what you would see on the negative. All, all of us, I think, old, here are old enough to remember taking film to Kmart and getting it developed. Um, you only see the lifelike image of the shroud on the photographic negative, which means that the shroud is like, it, the image itself is like a photographic negative. It's not strictly a photograph. We don't know how the image got on the cloth. Um, but I think, you know, I think the shroud has um, helped to bring Protestants and, and Catholics together to some degree. Uh, a lot of Protestants are skeptical of the shroud from the get-go because they think it's a Catholic relic. Um, but people that have taken the time to study the shroud, uh, this, is, this month is the 47th anniversary of when I started uh, studying the shroud. You have people that have studied it longer than I have. Um, and it's just a marvelous image and, and enlightens, I think, like I say, the, the scriptures, it, it fills in maybe a few details that we don't get from the scriptures. And I think it, you know, really, um, can put a stamp of reality and approval on, on the gospels, uh, which, and you know, nowadays you, I'm sure everybody has heard stories of people that are claiming uh, Jesus never even existed. I mean, you know, when I grew, when I was growing up, you rarely, if ever, heard that. But now that's very prominent, and I think that points to both the the I, when people say Jesus never existed, and when some skeptics question the authenticity of the shroud, I think that points to a fear that they have that. Um, about Jesus, that if they believe in him, they're going to have to change their lives and they won't, and they don't necessarily want to do that. So it's psychological, from a psychological point of view, it's very easy to say, oh, I'm not even sure he existed. Therefore, I can do what I want. Having sort of talked about the general level, let's dive in a little bit more specifically. There are Two things of significance visible on the shroud, the image and the bloodstains. So here's how it appears in real life. And here's what Joe was talking about, the, the negative view of it. And there's these two kinds of images. One is the bloodstains. And they're just that, bloodstains. And you can see that they're the darker images here. Um, they show up as the very white images on, on the negative. And then there is the sort of more ghostly image of the body where, and whereas the blood images can, or the blood stains can soak through the body image exists only on the topmost surface of the threads. But let's tackle the blood stains first. So with the blood stains, and, and this is for the audience. I mean, you know, this very well, Joe, um, we see, various wounds that correspond to what the gospels indicate. Man's been nailed through the hands and, and feet. Um, it's been scourged, whipped, pierced through his side, apparently been pierced with a crown of thorns. Um, so what, what do you think is most interesting and important first about the bloodstains? Um, well, first I'll point out that um, we have two, different things going on in terms of the image in the blood. The blood soaks all the way through the, through the cloth down, you know, through the, the, the complete fibrils and threads. Mm -hmm. 
whereas the image is only on the top several thousandths of an inch of the fiber and only goes one or two microfibrils deep. So the blood is a contact image, whereas the image, um, because we have image where the, the cloth was not touching the body, it's it's includes being a non-contact image, which suggests possibly radiation. But anyway, the blood... Um, What's interesting about the blood, I think, is that it's got all the components. Heller and Adler uh, of STIRP did 12 different tests that prove that there's really blood there. Uh, you will have some skeptics claim that it's not blood, it's iron oxide, it's this, it's that. It's a, but Heller and Adler have did 12 tests that prove that it's actually blood. And the blood seems to, the stains seem to, um, show their state um, as it was on the body. But then, oddly enough, they, they're not smeared. So if, you know, if you, if you have a Band-Aid on a wound and, and you, you, you rip off the Band-Aid, it could mess up the, the look of the, uh, of the wound. Whereas in the shroud, it looks like the, the, the wounds as, as it appeared on the body, but the, it suggests that since they're undisturbed, that the cloth, that the body was removed from the cloth in such a manner that's just not natural. So we've got the, the blood and then we've got the image. Mm -hmm. And as you and Robert have just been saying, the blood soaks all the way through the shroud, but the right. image only appears in the very, very top most layer. So what can you tell us about this image itself, both um, what it's comprised of and your theories as to how it got on the cloth? Mm -hmm. A lot of the scientists believe that um, based on the superficiality of the image, whatever caused the image came from the body itself, as opposed to something coming onto the, the body externally. And, you know, a controlled radiation is a possibility. Um, I, I, I'm not super big personally on, on trying to determine what type of radiation it was. I'll let the scientists do that. I read all their stuff when they say something, but the, the farthest I go usually is to say, I believe that the image was caused at the moment of what we call the resurrection. Um, and I, I tend to leave it at that. And just to be clear, we don't have another burial shroud at all with any kind of image that looks even remotely like the one we have on the Shroud of Turin, correct? Absolutely. The shroud is, is utterly unique in the whole world. The image is uniform. So where it's darker, there's just more fibrils that have, have degraded. Um, and you might have... A, a, a fiber that's been dehydrated and yellowed and the fiber next, the, the thread right next to it is not, which is another odd characteristic of it. Uh, you have the, so you got the superficiality, you got three dimensional information encoded. Um, and um, it, the, the, between the negative, the superficiality and the three dimensionality, I don't see any way a, a medieval forger could have even accidentally got all those three. I mean, yeah. you'll get, you'll see people claim that, Oh, he, he just got a negative by the way he did it or something, but um, humans can come up with all sorts of excuses or reasons why something happens that make absolutely no sense at all. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you're taught, you've talked about the 3d characteristics and I want to get into that and the negativity. Um, the the negative characteristic is a very special property. I want to go ahead and share let me share another slide. Okay, so on the left we have a photo of the shroud as it appears in life. Okay, this very very faint image. This might even be somewhat darkened photographically. The image, yeah, it here. is. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we have a negative taken of it. So if you see this image on the left, it doesn't look very lifelike. Um, it kind of reminds you of the old film you'd take to Kmart or, you know, whatever to get developed. And then when you do the negative of it, it gets, you know, very lifelike. And, and this, as I was saying at the start, is what launched the scientific study of the shroud. Suddenly, it looks like a real face. All kinds of details become apparent that were not apparent before. Um, and this just, this just seems hugely significant. Um, so, you know, could you speak to the significance of that negativity in your eyes? Mm -hmm. Well, in... Um... When the first public photos were taken in 1898, those those were the days they had the the big uh, glass plates instead of film, and um, you have to remember um, photography. I think the first picture, which even went by a different name, uh, there's it's a French term that I don't re remember how to spell or say. Uh, I think it was taken in 1826 in Paris. So when the first pictures of the shroud were taken in 1898, we're only, what, 70 years into photography with the big old cameras and big tripods and glass plates. And it was taken by an amateur photographer who was a lawyer named Secunda Pia. Um, the shroud was brought out in 1898 for a royal wedding. It was owned by the House of Savoy at that time. And... Um, they would often bring out the shroud during weddings uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and when Secunda Pia um, took out the glass plate after develop developing it, he said he later wrote that he he almost dropped it because, you know, he expected a negative of whatever he saw on the cloth. And I'm not sure exactly how what he, you know, what Im what characteristics that would have had compared to what we see from the on the cloth with the naked eye, but he certainly did not expect to see the lifelike image on his negative, and he said he almost dropped the plate. And just you know, people immediately instead of you know trying to be objective about it said, oh, you know, he faked it, you know, and he the poor man lived with it until. The next exhibition um, in 1931. By that time, he was in his 70s or something. And that then the, by that time, they had a professional photographer named uh, Giuseppe Henri, and he took the photos and got the same effect. And so Pia was was finally vindicated that he had, had not manipulated his photos in in um, 1898. And then, and like you say, that sort of jump started uh, those photos. Uh, jump started research in the shroud scientists were intrigued by that how how could um a negative show such lifelike characteristics right on the negative plate you know but look look like it's positive so um the french academy of sciences in 1902 held a meeting and there was a French, uh, I think it was a zoologist named Yves Delage, who was agnostic, um, wanted to present a paper on the shroud to the French Academy of Sciences, and it was refused. They were already starting to worry about the religious implications of this mm -hmm. of this object. And Pia kind of got upset. Um, I'm not Pia, excuse me, Delage, and because he, he believed that it it was a remnant of the historical Jesus. And he said, you know, if this was an Achilles or a Sargon, uh, nobody would raise any objections. And he says, I, uh, all I'm saying is this, I believe that uh, this is, has a connection to the historical Jesus. So if people get pretty uptight with um, the, the marriage of, of science and religion uh, when it comes to the shroud, if they think that it, it, the science is going to affect their religion. So, as I said, I, it's easier for people just to ignore the evidence and just sort of dismiss it outright without looking at it. People started studying it in the 1900s uh, more readily. There were exhibitions in 1931 and 1933. And then um, in 1978, uh, a group of American scientists named the 
Shroud of Turin Research Project was allowed to study the shroud, and they discovered in nine, about two years before they went over the 3D effect through something called a VP8 image analyzer. Um, Joe, which, let me let me share a slide sure. about that. So you can go ahead. Um, so the VPH, VP8 image analyzer um, was not developed by NASA, as, as often is said, but um, it it was it was developed to for people to look to get more information out of X-rays and and different things, um, and you can duplicate its its um, characteristics with a lot of software today. But it was it was highly a, it was kind of a one of a kind thing um, back in 1976 when it first developed, and um, if you put a regular picture in it it normally comes out dis distorted. But a couple of people- I have a photo of myself for purposes of this uh, or someone who uh, looks like uh, me. <laughs> yeah. But see, see that, you don't get a real face. I mean, you can't, you really always you can't tell that it's, that it is a face. Yeah. You know, it really comes out jumbled. Yeah. So- um, hmm. But with the shroud- But the shroud, it comes out a proportional and and um, you know you can tell it's a face. You can tell it's, you can see the features clearly, and so the shroud is the the only. Some people will dispute this, of course, too. But um, the shroud is the only image that you can uh, put in the VP8 image analyzer and get an accurate 3D relief, which and suggests that that it was a real body. And that's that's been said by the guy who invented the mm -hmm. technology. He said he'd never seen yeah. a photo produce that effect before or since. Yeah, Gosh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, in in 1988, a carbon dating analysis was done to the shroud that said that the shroud originated between 1260 and 1390. And this turned out to be an absolutely watershed moment in the Shroud's history because since that carbon dating was done, so much of the conversation around the Shroud has been like, well, the scientific data has spoken and the Shroud is clearly a fake. And yet there's just been an enormous amount of, of hard science research done on the shroud that supports its authenticity. And so you have obviously published a book on the carbon dating. So what went wrong with that carbon dating process in your view? Um, everything. Um, <laughs> they, they did, they did a lot of planning. Um, in 1986, they held a three-day workshop in Turin to try to plan for the eventual testing of the shroud. And they had archaeologists and C-14 scientists and STIRP scientists and religious figures um, get together in Turin to try to come up with a, a protocol to date the shroud. And originally, they were going to take, uh, they were going to use about seven labs and they were going to take samples from at least like three different um, locations. And the reason for that is that to take, you want to take it from more than one sample to make sure that all the samples agree. So if you only take it from one sample, if you've got a bad portion of the cloth for whatever reason, reason and you test that, you get the results, you really don't know if that's what you're going to get on other parts of the cloth. But despite the fact that they had the protocol and everything set up, when the time came to cut the sample in, on April 21st, 1988, uh, two of the um, scientists, Italian scientists, argued for about an hour and a half of where they would take the sample from. And they finally decided to take it from the, the lower left corner of the frontal image, which had a portion missing. I think, you know, the, several of the corners have um, 
portions missing because they they were cut out and given out given out as relics. The Savoy family would would give out relics at the weddings and that sort of thing. Um, and so the reasoning seemed to be that a portion had been taken from that lower left corner in 1973 for textile analysis and the cardinal's uh, scientific advisor thought well that that area has already been cut on we'll just take one sample from there and that way we won't have to to, to cut any other samples but that was a really bad decision because you you come up with that bad scenario of one sample the, in an area that was probably repaired and you don't know if it's representative of the whole cloth and they dated it and came out with 1260 to 1390 and it was said with 95% confidence that it was medieval. Um, one interesting thing I found was that in 1985, um, Cardinal Ratzinger, who eventually became Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, um, approved some uh, proposal that Sterp had proposed to study the shroud for two weeks and include a C14 test. That would have been wonderful. Sterp knew the most about the shroud. Some now Ratzinger at the time was probably the third most powerful man in the Vatican, uh, somewhere around there probably. And he approved it. And somehow some group or uh, some individuals were powerful enough to get that overridden and to get Sterp drummed out. And then um, the three scientists, the three labs uh, that did it all had the same piece. It was cut up. One sample was taken. They each got a sample, Arizona, in fact, got two because the first piece they cut for them was a little too small. So they took another piece uh, and then they kept the reserve in in Turin, uh, which later was eventually given to um, a Sterp scientist who found something very interesting there. Um, but the labs were were asked to release their raw data and in any scientific experiment there's what they call the raw data, which is the basic information that they use to, to come to their conclusions. And many requests were made to the British Museum who oversaw the testing um, for that data and the British Museum continually refused to release it. And it wasn't finally released until 2017 through a Freedom of Information Act. And then when statisticians um, examine the data, they discovered that the scientists had basically manipulated the, the, the figures in a way that they could claim uh, that it was with 95% confidence rate. But the statistician says, no, you, that was, you, you, based on the figures we now see, you can't, you can't uh, have concluded that, that it, that's incorrect. So, um, and Joe, just to just yeah. to break in, what that means, am I right? Is that across the the area that that the samples were taken from, it wasn't consistent in age. Right. It uh, it it varied by something like what do I want to say ninety one years every every centimeter or something like that. And you mm. shouldn't you shouldn't have that much variation in such a small piece. It was kind of like one centimeter by seven centimeters. Um, but Joe, you, the, the, if the church owns the shroud and there's all this confusion about the authenticity of the date, then why doesn't the church say, okay, let's just clear this up once and for all. We'll take samples from different places, mm -hmm. see if they align. Like what is preventing that process from moving forward so that we have an answer as to the authenticity mm -hmm. of the shroud. The church never declares any relic as authentic. What they do is they allow people to venerate the, uh, an object or a relic if there's not definite proof that it's a forgery, okay? So by the fact that the church has allowed 
continued exhibitions and veneration at the Shroud since 1988 shows that they don't put total stock in the belief that it is medieval. However, they will never go so far as to say, um, we believe it's authentic and therefore you must, they don't make a, a, anybody believe that any relic is authentic. That's just church practice and it has all, ha, always has been. And there's just kind of a, a basic mis, misunderstanding even among Catholics on, on how that works. Well, while we're on this topic, we, we can't have you on here without asking you about the invisible reweave idea that, that you and your late wife, Sue Benford, mm -hmm brought forward in the year 2000. I know there'd been some some talk about it here and there, mm -hmm. but when when you two presented your findings um, and then it went from there to Ray Rogers, it really yeah. changed the, the, yeah. the shroud field. So can you tell us that story? Sure. So um, when when the dating came out in 88, by that time I had been studying the shroud for 11 years and I knew something had to be wrong with that date. I didn't meet Sue until 1997. She called me on the phone and um, said she believed the shroud was authentic. And um, we eventually got together as, as Robert said, I, I left the monastery and we, we teamed up and started doing research and she got an insight one day that uh, I'd, I'd call it a spiritual insight that the, that the area had been repaired. She, she asked me to get out some of my pictures. I got a very, very good collection of, of materials probably right now, probably one of the best top three in the world of personal mm. English language materials that I've been collecting since 1977. And she looked at a close-up, be a high-quality uh, picture of the, the C-14 area. And she noticed um, what she thought might be some evidence of manipulations. So she had the idea that um, she would show this picture to several textile experts and see what they said. In Columbus, we had a, a, a European-born man named David Pearson, um, and who was uh, from France, I think, originally, and was versed in, in you know, old-time uh, textile techniques. So she literally brought him a picture of of um, the close-up of the Zurich sample, did not tell him um, that it was a picture of the shroud and just kind of asked for his general um, observations. And so basically he said, um, this area has been manipulated and he called it a patch. And we started using that term. As it turns out later, we, we adjusted our findings a little bit and turns out that patch wasn't the the mm -hmm. uh the best word to use because a, a patch kind of um suggests you know you got one part of the cloth here and then you add another different part or a new cloth here and and put them together mm -hmm. as it turns out later we we think that the threads were were spliced individually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So patch kind of gives the wrong idea if that's if that's uh, what in fact happened. So we sent it to two other um, uh, textile places, one in Albany, New York. Uh, that place is out of business now. Uh, but that person said that um, she noticed some um, manip manipulations. Yeah, but the, the, the key thing is that... Um, you know, three different textile experts without knowing that it's the shroud. Um, they saw think, something. There. Saw, saw something that they suggested to them that um, that it was manipulated. So then we did. We started doing further research into uh, historical techniques 
related to textiles and discovered there was a, a technique in medieval France called the, the invisible reweave, or French uh, reweaving. goes by several different names. I've got like three or four different manuals now um, that tell you how to do it. And it, it kind of suggests that it's, it's a rare technique and not a lot of people know about it. And it's hard to do. And it, I think one of the manuals said something like, if, if you do your work well, nobody will be able to tell that you even did it or something like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which is, which is the idea. So when you repair a textile, you want to make any repairs look like the original. So Ray Rogers, who was uh, the chemist on STERP, um, he thought our theory was was crazy at first. He even, he even called us part of the lunatic fringe because we weren't scientists. But then he he was literally the the only person in the world that could have you know disproved or proved um, our our hypothesis because he still had um, samples from the main part of the shroud from 1978, and he had those legally or whatever they it wasn't that he took them or anything he he was allowed to have those samples because the, the scientists from 78 were allowed to keep the work that they did and also the samples that they had worked on um so he um he found in in the main part of the 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 shroud the samples did not compare with the samples that he had had from the near the C14 area. So originally he had some of the, the fibers from the 1973 cutting that I had mentioned. Mm -hmm. Then after you remember, I also mentioned that when they took the sample in 1988, they had cut the one sample up, gave one sample to each of the labs and two, two pieces for Arizona that equaled the weight of the other single pieces that the other two labs had. And Turin kept a sample back. And Ganella, who was a, a Cardinal Belchero's um, advisor, sent to Ray Rogers a, some threads from the middle of the sample that they had kept behind. Mm. So Rogers now had the main shroud samples. He had some of the fibers from the Reyes samples in 1973. Reyes right is next, the right, yeah, yeah, which was right, right next to the C14 sample, yeah. and then he actually got literal C14 threads, and he compared the the C14 sample to the main part, and found that there were chemical differences, and he found um, a, a a dye which you would use to you know, aesthetically repair an area that needed, uh, you know, restoration. Um, he found the, the, uh, the dye, the gum mordant that uh, it fixes the, the dye to the cloth. And he found a spliced thread of cotton and linen. A whole thread. One thread that was cotton and linen, so, you know, twisted together. Yeah. And he sent, he didn't trust his own judgment by itself. So he sent it to a guy at, uh, that he knew from Los Alamos National Laboratories, which is one of the finest laboratories in the country. And um, that chemist uh, enlisted, I think, eight other, eight, yes, eight other scientists. And they did some study on it. And um, they ultimately determined that uh, that that area had been man manipulated. So Ray Rogers went from calling us lunatic fringe to saying, I can't believe it, but I think they're right. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to see how much, you know, online you can see all that just dismissed and considered refuted. Mm -hmm. And the Wikipedia page on the shroud is like a crime scene. Um, but it's a great <laughs> story because he showed in all kinds of ways that the, the, Co the chemical composition of those samples that were carbon dated is truly different than the rest of the sh shroud. Something, something went wrong. 
and the reweave sounds like the most logical possibility, mm -hmm. but something is wrong there. Mm -hmm. So I just think, you know, I, a bunch of people, you know, including many, including many onlookers like me, were trying to figure out what went wrong. And we latched on to the bioplastic coating idea. We latched on to the, the resurrection altered the carbon content mm. idea. And then you two came along and it just seemed so eminently reasonable. Um, so that was a huge contribution. Um, one of the things that's just vexed me for decades is I have a lot of background um, just, you know, personally in Jesus scholarship, New Testament scholarship, textual analysis mm -hmm. of, the, of the New Testament. Um, and then I've been reading about the Shroud for all these years. And the weird thing is, is that if the Shroud is genuine, it, it's the most direct and important evidence we have about Jesus. And yet the Jesus scholars almost uniformly ignore it on the one side. Yeah. And then on the other side, another th issue of mine is that the Shroud people treat the Gospels as like functionally perfect, so that if the Shroud is going to be genuine, it has to line up, say, for instance, with what the Gospel of John says. And from my background in New Testament studies, I don't consider the Gospels anywhere near perfect. They contain mm -hmm. history, in my view, and non-history. And so I feel like it is so essential for these two fields to talk to each other. Um, I tried to arrange a thing 20 some years ago, uh, uh, like a conversation, debate, Barry Schwartz from shroud.com, you know him, signed on, Ian Wilson, shroud author, signed on for the shroud side, but I could not find any New Testament scholars mm. that would sign on for the Jesus scholarship side. And so nothing ever happened anyway. I, I feel like it's so essential for those two sides to talk to each other. They hardly do, you know, it, there's very few exceptions. So what do you think is going on there? And is there anything you'd like to see happen mm. in this respect? You know, it, it's important to remember the shroud um, brings up strong emotions in, in almost everybody. There, obviously, there are some people that that don't care one way or the other. But if you're if you're for it, you know, passionately for it or passionately against it, <laughs> the passions come out, mm -hmm. you know. And depending on your cultural or religious upbringing and stuff, you you know, there, there's different attitudes people have to the shroud. And I think you know, I think there's many scientists that um, probably believe the shroud's authentic, but are afraid to to speak out because they're mm -hmm. worried about their reputations. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of biblical scholars um, are also worried about their reputations. If they can come out and say, they think it's authentic. I think, I think we have tons more evidence for the shroud than for lots of things that we have less evidence for, but still consider fact or, or, or our strong probability, at least. Um, there has been an explosion uh, of YouTube videos in the last uh, five years, certainly. Mm -hmm. I, I see more interest by Catholic priests now and even Protestant ministers. Um, I think we just have to keep on um, dialoguing and and. I, you know, I don't think the, the shroud's certainly not going to go away. Um, I certainly intend to to work on it the rest of my life and um, disseminate it as best we can. Um, I, I guess I could say here it's it's kind of public knowledge now that um, the comedian Rob Schneider um, got wind of the story of Sue and me and thought it would make an interesting movie. So he's been trying for about five years um, to get a based on a true story, which which gives them mm. a lot of latitude to yeah right to Hollywood it up, um, and he's looking for investors. And I'm actually I'm supposed to do a podcast with he's going on different interviews because he re recently converted to Catholicism, and he's been talking about trying to get the movie made, and um, 
I'm going to be doing a podcast talking mm. mostly uh, talking a lot about the movie. So I think that's mm. a, a, a nice way to um, get the message of the shroud across to people because let's face it, sitting in a comfy chair in a theater for an hour and a half and, and learning some stuff about the shroud is, is probably more pleasant than, than going through a physicist's uh, uh, article about the shroud that's got formulas and math and yeah. footnotes and all that, that good stuff. So I'm, yeah. if you don't, if I'd appreciate prayers from you folks that the, the, the movie sees the light of day, I, I, that would I be see, great. I see all the junk on TV and it's like, good Lord, that's mediocre. I mean, the story of Sue and me is an interesting one and it's on an important topic. I would think that somebody uh, would, would want to invest in it and try to get the message out there, but yeah. we'll keep plugging. And there's a lot of, you know, there, there are, there probably aren't as many synthologists as we'd like, but we're a hardcore bunch. And a lot of us have been studying it for 40 and 50 years. And, and we just continue to try to get the message out and any, podcast uh like yours or uh, other people um uh helps get that done mm. okay well we have kept you longer than we said um so thank you so much for for joining us today um and and really for just what you've been doing for these decades mm. i'm intrigued by your mm -hmm. collection as well mm. um so emily did you want to say anything in closing I just echo Robert's comments and thank you, Joe, for being here. Thank you for all of your dedication and scholarship to The Shroud. Mm -hmm. We hope that that movie does get made. Um, you, you and Rob, I was just, I, I Googled Rob, you, you look alike a bit. <laughs> So, just like so, me and George Clooney. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully you can get that movie made and get more information about the shroud out there. Because as we have been saying, if the shroud is proven to be legitimate, then it is like the most historical mm. finding that that you can imagine. Yeah. It's it's documented evidence that Jesus exists that he died and and was resurrected and mm -hmm. and I think I agree with you that one of the reasons why this has been has become so political has become blocked in certain ways is because if this is true if this really is Jesus then that means a tremendous amount of, of change and upheaval absolutely for our world and so Anyway, I just wanted to thank you uh, for your time, for your dedication, for your scholarship and your contributions to an incredibly important topic for our world.